mass incarceration means that we've got a very high rate of incarceration historically, comparatively. And the other thing is the rate of incarceration is so high, so socially concentrated, that we're no longer incarcerating the individual, but we're incarcerating whole social groups. The rate of incarceration now is about five times higher than it was historically. Historically it was 100 per 100,000, now it's about 500 per 100,000. If we look at prison, if we add jail to that, it's about 700 per 100,000. Nowhere in the world incarcerates as much as we do. We've seen extremely high rates of exposure to the criminal justice system for African American men with very low levels of schooling. So if we think about black men who were born in the late 1970s and who were growing up through the American prison boom of the 1980s and the 1990s, the chances that they're going to serve time in state or federal prison if they dropped out of high school is about 70%. So going to prison for that group of black men with very low levels of schooling, that's become a normal life event. And that's really only happened in the last 10 years. We're at this point now where there's about 1.2 million African-American children with a parent who's incarcerated. And that's about one in nine. The research shows the kids who experience parental incarceration have diminished school achievement, they have behavioural problems, depressive symptoms, acting out. And there's also evidence that these kinds of negative effects associated with parental incarceration are concentrated more among boys than among girls. And there's a very real risk here that incarceration becomes an inherited trait. The underlying issue is we've chosen prison as a way to respond to that problem of crime. And there are a whole variety of ways that we could have chosen to respond to that problem of crime. We've chosen the response of the deprivation of liberty. And we've chosen the response of the deprivation of liberty for a historically aggrieved group whose liberty in the United States was never firmly established to begin with. Good morning, First Baptist, Bridge Nation, welcome to worship. I'm coming to you today from the Southampton Police Department in Southampton, New York. Before I get started, I'd like to personally thank Chief Thomas Cummings and our brother, Detective Herman Lamison, for the use of this space today. And I know what you're asking. What's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. While I'm not preaching from our usual house of worship today, I am still preaching from a place of reformation, transformation, and restoration in this community. And while I know this is not accurate for every precinct or member of law enforcement in the country, I am aware of the positive efforts being made by the agents of this one. I'm a proud member of the Community Law Enforcement Review Committee, or CLERC, as we're known where local leaders, including a diverse selection of clergy leaders from this community, have been engaged in meaningful and productive dialogue for months in order to provide a foundation and foster continued efforts to provide the most up-to-date policing model, ensuring community trust, mutual respect, and the shared belief of the dignity and sanctity of human life for all people. And as I sit here now, I can't help but to think of all the people who sat here before me. I wonder, did they pace as they pondered the predicament that landed them in this place? Or did they find comfort in their confinement with hopes of finding clarity? When they left this place, were they freed from their felonies to continue a life uninterrupted? Or were they condemned to further confinement? I wonder, 
Was it an aha moment or an all hell moment? And I wonder most of all how their lives changed or didn't as a result of their time spent here. <laughs> and lest you even think about sitting in the judgment seat against anyone who may have sat here, let me correct you. Because if you're honest, there are some unauthorized authorities that you've been approached, arrested, and apprehended by, and you're still doing the time. Can we be real about it? And lest you believe that the idea of incarceration is strictly limited to a prison system or a jail cell, allow me to not so subtly suggest that we are all prisoners of our own predicaments. Who am I talking to today? Please, you're behind the bars of bills. You've been caged in conformity, confined by corporate America, constricted by your call. Some of you are detained by debt, enslaved by economic downturn. You've been imprisoned by impossibility and incarcerated by insecurity. You are jailed by jealousy and locked down by laziness. You've been nailed by your nerves and you are penned in by the prison of your mind. Some of you have been restricted by your relationships and shut in by shame and sentenced to sin and trapped by trials and tribulation. So to you, I ask, what's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this? Oh, in short, we're all prisoners of something doing our best to serve our time. We all have our own personal patness, and usually we're clear on how we got here. <laughs> a poor decision, a lapse in judgment, extenuating circumstances, a pretty face, a smooth talking stranger, a stiff drink or a strong substance, wrong place, wrong time, standing up for what's right or ignorance about what's wrong. For John, it was for preaching the word of God and his testimony about Jesus. How ironic that the one who preaches the gospel that sets the captives free finds himself, in fact, a captive. You see, often we're clear on what got us here. What we're not clear on is what do we do once we get here? Well, for the answer, we look to the Patmos experience of John. John, the loyal, loved, lethargic, legal guardian, last supper, long suffering, lauded and now lone apostle is exiled on the island of Patmos. Just to backtrack, Patmos is a small island in the Aegean Sea and isolated volcanic island that was used by the Romans to imprison political exiles of which John was one, having been sent there by Emperor Domitian. And according to historians, the island is only 10 miles long and five miles wide. It is dry and ashy and barren, rocky and steep. And given his advanced age, John was likely not required to work the mines as others were while exiled on Patmos. But let's face it, work or no work, living in such intolerable isolation was punishment enough. And while John was not sentenced to manual labor, we soon find that he will labor as he always has in the gospel of Jesus Christ, proving that what you're doing in a place like this is not as important as what you do and what God does through you while you're in that place. The book of Revelation is written in apocalyptic form with great imagery and symbolism. Therefore, one would expect John to do something extraordinary, worthy of inclusion as the conclusion of the Bible. Am I right about it? I mean, think about it. Perhaps a great prison break scene featuring the Apostle John to rival that of Andy Dufresne in the Shawshank Redemption, or maybe a great escape under the cover of night in the Aegean Sea to meet allies in Ephesus like Athos, Porthos, Aramis, and D'Artagnan in The Man in the Iron Mask, or maybe Maybe a new disciple enters the prison, meets John on the island, and springs him like Michael and Lincoln on prison break. Any one of these scenarios would make for a great season finale. But John does something even more radical than any of that, something likely that neither you nor I would even consider doing under these circumstances. He worships. Watch the text. I was exiled. 
to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Verse 10, it was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. I can hear some of you saying, Pastor Tish, worship is not radical. Oh, but I beg to differ because we learn here today that worship is not only radical, but also revelatory. You see, 1 John states it was the Lord's day. This is the only use of the phrase in the New Testament, likely referring to Sunday, the day when at the time of our text is increasingly growing as the day of Christian worship as a weekly commandment commemoration of the resurrection. Even in a Patmos place, John continues to do what he's always done, worship. The statement, it was the Lord's day, confirms for us that John does not worship out of desperation, but rather default. Let me help you here. You see, a default setting is a setting that is automatically given to a software application, computer program, or device. So take, for example, your phone. When your phone starts to malfunction, you can restore it to its default settings. And after that, it's fine and in perfect working order. However, most people activate the default setting as a last result because it restores only the most necessary programs to the phone and requires the removal of the superfluous software like apps, alerts, and games that people have become dependent on that produce the problem in the first place. I hope you're with me. However, as with our phones and in life, I'm sure you'll find that in the absence of what you deemed needful and necessary, you'll learn that the default setting is really all you need. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that we often worship God out of desperation and we don't seek God until we find ourselves in a place like this. Oh, brothers and sisters, don't become so dependent on your superfluous software, your status, money, power, fame, and career, much of what produced the problem in the first place, that you're reluctant to restore your divine default. A Patmos place helps us to understand that you don't know God is all you need until God is all you got. Somebody say amen. You see, John never stops praising and praying on Patmos. He did what he always knew to do. We stop worshiping under much less strenuous conditions. Oh, but there's something you need to know. When talking about settings of a program, the default settings are the settings chosen by the software developer and not the user. And John's default setting was activated on the day of Pentecost. In the absence of God with us, Jesus gave the disciples a software upgrade to God in us. You see, John was present in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit was activated and he received power. That same spirit that carried him at Pentecost through preaching, through church planting and persecution is the same spirit that carries him through Patmos. Oh, I can hear hear Ezekiel saying the spirit carried me. If you're honest, most days you don't have the strength to carry on a conversation, let alone carry yourself through this thing we call life. But aren't you glad today? Aren't you grateful today for the power of the Holy Spirit that carries you and comforts you? It's that same spirit that carried you through the last calamity is the same spirit that's going to carry you through this one. I ought to have a witness that says the same spirit that carried me through my last illness is the same thing that's going to carry me through this one. John says, I was in the spirit. This phrase means that he was in ecstasy in which he was lifted beyond the things of space and time into the world of eternity. Ecstasy on exile seems impossible until you understand that his body was on Patmos, but his spirit was free. John was in Patmos and John was in the spirit. This is crazy because you heard what Patmos is like. You've experienced it from John's purview, the hurt and the hardship he was enduring. And yet Patmos was no match for his praise. No matter where you are, no matter how hard life is, no matter what you are passing through, it's still possible. 
possible to be in the spirit. Don't you know today that praise and prayer are portable? When the Emperor Domitian sent John to Patmos, it was supposed to break him. That's what Patmos was known for. That was what many present day prisons are known for. This was never meant to be a positive experience. John was supposed to die, but instead of becoming a martyr like all the other apostles at this point, John becomes a miracle. Thank you, Bishop Guy Robinson. John is the statistical exception to the norm. Don't you know that where you are right now, the hardship that you're going through, your struggle, your pain, this Patmos place that you find yourself in has been designed to break you, to stress you, to depress you, to make you lose your mind. You weren't supposed to make it this far, but Jesus said, I'm going to make you the statistical exception to the norm. Ha! Because long before it was a hot button issue, Jesus pioneered prison reform. So your place of retribution is now being reformed to a place of rehabilitation in Jesus name. John's praise, his worship wasn't solely for catharsis, but for connection. Remember, isolation is harmful to the human experience. Isolation disconnects. Therefore, the need for connection, especially for loved ones, is key. Who would understand this better than the one who Jesus loved? Isn't it good to know that in a place designed for disconnect, John never lost his connection to God. And here's the good news. You won't either. God knows where you are. The question is, what are you going to do while you're here? What's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this? Somebody say, I'm worshiping in a place like this. If it worked for John on Patmos, it'll work for you too. He said it was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Hey, it's the Lord's day and I'm worshiping in a jail cell. It's the Lord's day and I was worshiping in debt. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in a toxic relationship. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the hospital room. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in a trap house. It was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in a dead end job. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in a worldwide pandemic. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in over my head. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in anxiety and depression. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in a world of trouble. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in the face of domestic terrorism. I wish I had a witness today. Oh, wait, I have two. You see, along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners could not believe their ears. Then without warning, a huge earthquake, the jailhouse tottered, every door flew open, and all the prisoners were loose. I don't know about you, First Baptist. I don't know about you, Bridgehampton, but I feel a loosing in the atmosphere today. I feel because of your praise, because of your worship, because of your courage, because of your steadfastness, some doors are flying open in your favor. What are you going to do in the place that you're in? Somebody say, I'm going to praise God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to lift my hands to God. I'm going to get on my knees to God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I am ahead and not beneath. Come on, somebody. Let's get excited about a God that knows where you are and is opening doors for you. You will not be in Patmos forever. I hear the loosing in the atmosphere today. What's a nice kid like you doing in a place like this? Somebody say, I'm worshiping God anyhow. I'm counting my blessings anyhow. I may be crying in the midnight hour. I may be in pain. I may be struggling, but I still trust God. Lord, we still love you. Lord, we still glorify you. Lord, we still magnify you. Lord, we trust you and believe in you. Can you say that today? Where I am today in this jail cell is only symbolic of the cells you find yourself in in life. But you can break free today. You can be loosed today. A divine revelation is yours today if you can worship while you're here. 
just as this door has been opened, what we would say if we were in the church house is that the doors of the church are opened. It is the Lord's day. And we're inviting you to be part of God's family. We're inviting you. Remember that connection I talked about? We're inviting you to connect with Jesus today. He knows exactly where you are, exactly what you need, exactly what you've been crying about and worrying about and praying about. You are not forgotten. I wonder if there was any moment where John maybe felt that. But as we'll learn next week, there was a divine presence even on Patmos. And I want you to know that you have access to that same divine presence. And his name is Jesus. There's information at the bottom of your screen. Call us, email us, text us, connect with us as we connect with Christ. And there's another way you can do that too, by giving. One of our initiatives this year is to be more outreach focused, to be more of a blessing to our community. We do a pretty good job, but we're pushing the envelope. We're raising the bar this year, and we want you to partner with us in that endeavor. And how do you do that? Well, we just talked about worship, worship in giving. There are several ways for you to give. You can give the traditional way by mailing in your tithes and offerings to the church. You can also give via Givelify. Just look for our name, the First Baptist Church of Bridgehampton. You can also give via the Cash app. <laughs> that is, may, I won't say that's a superfluous app. We need that. <laughs> so if you go to Cash app and look for dollar sign Bridge Nation, you can find us there as well. And for those of you who live in the local area, you can contact one of our trustees or deacons and they will be happy to make arrangements to get the offering from you, to pick it up, to meet you somewhere, whatever needs to happen. We realize these are very interesting times and so we wanna make things as easy for you as possible. But more than anything, we wanna be a blessing to our community. We wanna be the arms and legs of God here. You know, a lot of people see people in distress, they see um, people who are hungry or homeless and, and we say to ourselves, why doesn't God do something about that? Guess what? God did. He made you. You can help us do something about that. So will you partner with us in giving today? Will you worship with us in giving today? We'd really appreciate it. And also, maybe you're not ready to make that step toward accepting Christ, or maybe you already have. Maybe you're still shaken from the events of this week. We understand. If you need prayer, you can call us too. We have a whole team of leaders who are ready, willing, and able to pray with you. And we're also here to answer any questions you may have. First Baptist, Bridge Nation, I love you. And above all else, God loves you. And we hope that in this place, this space that God has given us, we can do the great work that God has called us to. I'll see you next week. Have a blessed one.